Hello everybody and welcome to the very last seminar in the John Ryland's uh, Lunchtime Seminar Series. I'm Guy Armstrong from the Italian Department and the John Ryland's Research Institute and I'll be chairing this session today. We're broadcasting from various rooms in the historic John Ryland's Library today and as usual we'll be showing some collection objects and presenting new research on them. Today's seminar is entitled Cottonopolis, the Making of Global Manchester, and it'll be presented by Edmund Smith from the History Department and Jeanette Martin from the John Ireland's Library. So before I introduce our speakers for the last time, a few housekeeping notices. As usual, this event is being recorded and it will be edited and then made available on YouTube after the event. Audio subtitles are available using your own settings. We're using the Zoom webinar format, so that means that your camera and mic will be disabled throughout. At the end of the session, there'll be about 15 minutes for questions, we hope. So if you'd like to ask one, uh, please could you add them to the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. These will be then selected by me as the chair and relayed to the panelists. You can also use the chat function as we go along for comments and further questions. And we'll be monitoring both of these, so both the Q&A and the chat during the seminar. We're aiming to stop about 12.45, 12.50. As usual, we'd love your feedback about how it's gone. Um, and so we'll be sending out a feedback survey to you all after the event as well. So without further preamble, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Edmund Smith is Presidential Fellow in Economic Cultures at the University of Manchester and author of the book, Merchants, the Community that Shaped England's Trade and Empire, which was published last year by Yale University Press. Edmund's also published research in numerous academic journals and books, and this year they received the Distinguished Researcher of the Year Award at the University, so we are in the presence of greatness today. Across their work, Edmund is interested in histories of globalisation and capitalism, and is currently leading two projects at Manchester. The first, Risky Business, Investing in Innovation in Britain's Economic Development, is funded by the ESRC, and the second, Leg Legacies of the British Slave Trade, has received Arts and Humanities Research Council funding. Across these projects, Edmund seeks to interrogate the relationship between slavery, colonialism, international trade and industrialization with the aim of understanding the trajectories of economic growth that catapulted Britain towards its commercial and imperial position in the 19th century. And this will culminate in their second book, For Profit, How Entrepreneurs Forged Britain and Its Empire, which will include the story of how Manchester became Cottonopolis and how global collections shaped Britain as we know it today. Presenting with Edmund is our very own Jeanette Martin, uh, who repeat viewers will know to be the research and learning manager at the Rylands, and who, among other things, curates the Modern History Archive collections. Her research interests are in mid 19th century British radical culture and political speech, and she has a long standing interest in history from below. So, thank you both very much for concluding our seminar series, and over to you for the talk. Thanks very much for the introduction, Gaida. And the John Rylands Library holds a very extensive uh, collection of industrial and political and economic modern history. Um, our business archives range from textiles and coal to engineering to pharmaceuticals to transport and document the transformation of Manchester from a small town to a bustling metropolis. Cotton was key to Manchester's economic success. And as more people investigate the role of empire and slavery, these collections are undergoing greater scrutiny and are proving very useful for understanding this important topic. Major sources for the textile industry are the archives of Samuel Oldno, McConnell and Kennedy, Rylands and Son, Sun Mill and the Fielding Brothers of Todmorden. And today we're going to be looking at items from the papers of Robert Nicholson, a Liverpool merchant, the McConnell and Kennedy archives, and we're also going to finish by looking at some fabric samples from the John Rylands and Son archive. Um, I'd like to stress that the items that you're seeing today are just a very small snapshot of what we have. Um, do look in the chat for links to the collections that we're seeing today and our many other industrial and economic collections. So today's lecture is coming to you from the John Rylands Library and the widow of the John Rylands, uh, of Mr. John Rylands, Enriqueta Rylands built this library as a gift for the people of Manchester and it opened its doors on the 1st of January, 1900. As many of you will know, John Rylands made his millions through the cotton textile production and his com company, John Rylands and Sons was the largest textile business in Victorian Britain. 
Most of the cotton that Lancashire firms imported for processing was grown in the American South and picked by enslaved labor. Racism and exploitation lay at the heart of the trade. And now that I've set the scene over what collections we have at the Rylands and the library's own connections to cotton, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Edmund, who's going to tell you about his research. Thank you very much. And thank you to John Rylands for inviting me to speak here today. What we're talking about over the course of this next uh, 25 minutes or so is the relationship between the global experience of cotton, the cotton trade and this new commodity and how it came to Britain and the development of Manchester itself to show how global connection, as much as the local specificities of Manchester and the area of Lancashire, together connected and culminated in the creation of this new metropolis built around cotton that became known as Cottonopolis. If we can swap to the slideshow, you'll see in this first image that this connection between the global and the local was already well known by contemporaries. These paintings from the early 18th, early 19th century, sorry, show how uh, from this series called The Progress of Cotton, people understood that there was this relationship between the plantations in America, um, in the British Caribbean, and also uh, the North American colonies and the production of raw cotton there um, on these plantations with the production of goods in Manchester using these new industrialized machines, such as the printing role that you can see here, using styles, as we'll see in a few moments, that were inspired by another, another global connection to India. And it's these connections between India, Britain, Africa, and the Americas that stimulated and uh, generated the specific conditions of cotton's development in Britain itself. The development of cotton was of course not new in the 18th and 19th century, even though it was new to Britain. And it was something that had been going on for centuries um, across the rest of the world, especially in a subtropical region um, that included India, the Caribbean, West Africa, uh, and numerous other parts of the world where the cotton plant could grow naturally. Across these regions, cotton was turned into fabric, and there was an allure of cotton for international trade across the world. Much of this allure was because cotton was a fabric that was particularly suitable for these climates. It was lightweight, it was functional, um, and it was also very adaptable, but also because it could be used to print quite incredible designs, such as the ones as you can see on screen here, which are from Gujarat in the 12, from the 1200s and 1300s and incredibly rare examples of surviving fabrics. Travelers from Europe, of course, few and far between as they were during this very early period, recognized the wealth of cotton uh, and the value of these commodities and the, uh, the style that we can see here, the colors um, and the intricate design is something that couldn't really be produced easily and on the same scale in Western Europe. Early authors such as Herodotus commented on Indian cottons being luxurious items and later travelers like Marco Polo similarly commented on the way in which these pro uh, products were made across the region. By the time we move into the early modern period and Britain's first direct trade with India, um, we see these cottons being something that were already in high demand. They were understood and recognized as luxury fabrics that had a significant market in Britain and Europe. The East India Company was connected to this trend, this allure of cotton from India, and was founded in 1600 to trade directly to what was called the East Indies, with a charter that basically allowed it um, and gave it permission to be the only English traders to trade with a region that included East Africa, the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean world, Southeast Asia, and China and Japan. Initially, the interest of the East India Company was uh, more connected towards spices um, from the so-called Spice Islands, but quite quickly over the course of the 17th century, this was supplemented by an increasing interest in cotton. And by 1700, the company was importing around a million calico cloths every year to England. This, as you can imagine, was a huge impact on local industry, local consumer taste. Suddenly these bright fabrics, this lightweight cloth, these new designs were breaking into marketplaces in the way that were people living across England. However, at the same time, this was a substantial threat to England's traditional textile industry in woolens. 
And especially in the north of England, uh, in Yorkshire, as well as Norfolk and parts of the southwest, the production of woolen cloth was and had been for centuries the most important part of the typical local economy of many towns and villages across the country. What we saw with the introduction of this vast amount of calicos coming through the East India Company was therefore deemed a considerable threat. And initially, uh, the British state took on protectionist policies in the early 18th century to try and make sure that these calicos couldn't come in in such quantities that it would destroy the British industry of wool. However, at the same time, there were efforts, of course, to try and produce cotton cloth in Britain itself. And this is really the part of the story that we're talking about, this inspiration, these uh, webs of woven wind, as they were called in Asia, was something that had to be imitated and replicated within the British context, and a new industry was born. However, at the same time as this demand, this effort to try and replicate this Indian industry within the British context, of course, Britain had its uh, perennial problem of not being a tropical climate. And cotton couldn't be produced. It couldn't be grown raw cotton within the British Isles. So instead, new avenues for obtaining raw cotton had to be found. And the main way that this was achieved was through the exploitation of colonies in regions where cotton could be grown, initially in the Caribbean and then in North America. In these plantations, uh, which initially uh, produced huge amounts of sugar and other commodities in the 17th century, the shift towards cotton really took off in the latter 18th century, as you can see on the graph here on the right, which coincided with the explosion of industrialization within Britain and within Manchester specifically. You could see similar graphs as this for numerous, numerous other industrial commodities such as pig iron um, or other types of goods that similarly have this trajectory, this huge increase as machines and uh, new innovations allowed the production methods to change. But the production of raw cotton, of course, was necessary for this to happen. Without it, it would have been possible to sustain this sort of trajectory in England in terms of the manufacture of this raw cotton that was being brought in. To fuel this exploitation of the colonies in the Americas, British traders, uh, cotton traders, as well as other sorts of merchants, utilized uh, enslaved labor transported from Africa to work on these plantations. And as we know, both within colonies in the Caribbean and in North America, enslaved labor became the norm for producing raw cotton, as well as other goods like sugar. And this would be sustained throughout the development of industrial Britain and Manchester. The link is very, very strong. And this leads us on to the first of the items that we're going to be looking at today. Um, which is an account book, a letter book of the Liverpool merchant, Robert Nicholson, who in the uh, 1740s and 1750s was one of the earliest British traders to really seek out cotton as a major commodity that could be imported through Liverpool to fuel the growing um, manufacture of cotton cloth around Manchester. As we know, around the same period, the Gregg family was building Quarry Bank Mill and the first of the cotton mills using water power and as I've just said, to fuel that development, raw cotton was required. However, while raw cotton uh, and sugar were the predominant commodities that were sought from these colonies in the Caribbean, what we can see in items like this is that this wasn't a trade that was only conducted on a huge level. It wasn't massive conglomerates of the states, but it was an everyday trade. Hundreds, thousands of British merchants participated in these exchanges. And as you can see in this first folio, um, the types of goods that were being sent to the Caribbean to trade for cotton included a number of very common products from Britain. They included, as we can see here, iron nails, uh, as well as Irish linen, bottles of the best scotch, and surtout coats. These are commodities that are being used in the sense of nails to literally build the colony in Jamaica, uh, where this particular ship, the Tide, was being sent. Linen was, of course, used uh, both practically um, for things like sails and other items like that, as well as clothing. Surtout coats are, of course, overcoats that were designed uh, in particular for the elite of the island. And scotch, of course, is a consumable that people on the island uh, wished for as a, a luxury um, and that merchants like Nicholson were happy to provide. 
next page. However, to oversee this trade, Nicholson had to depend on his servants, the people who served him, his factors overseas. And this was essential because the distance between Britain and the Caribbean, of course, is great. And without modern communications, um, without modern modes of transportation, the security that they offer, this was a dangerous trip. And the origins of raw cotton, the way that they were brought into Britain, depended on merchants coming up with ways to overcome these difficulties. We can see this insecurity of the trade and the difficulties within this letter that Robert Nixon wrote to his servant overseas, um, who was based in Jamaica, explaining how he expected the trade to be conducted. And there are a couple of instances where we can see um, this particular insecurity. As you can see um, towards the top, th at the bottom of the top third of the text, uh, Nicholson requested that when the goods from the tiger were sold, his servant should send back either cotton or sugar. It didn't really matter to Nicholson which was sought after, as long as one of these commodities, whichever could be obtained for the best price, was sent back to Manchester, well, Liverpool, and then on to Manchester, because there was an obvious demand in Britain, even if it was difficult to pin down precisely what goods might be available at any one time. This insecurity is even more significant a few lines lower, whereas you can see Nicholson explains that in case of your mortality, uh, which God forbid, the servant that he had in Jamaica was expected to arrange for somebody else to take over these transactions. Disease, climate, and various other factors made this a very dangerous trade. Um, and therefore, there was an expectation that perhaps English traders and their servants might die during the process. And it was essential that these sorts of plans were put in place to overcome this difficulty. Finally, the Nicholson papers are really useful for showing the breadth of the market in Jamaica itself. And although it's a little difficult to read, on this page, we can see the sales of the items that the tiger had carried to Jamaica on behalf of Nicholson. And we can see people like Abraham Delian uh, or, or Elias Lazarus purchasing these commodities at a quite significant profit of around 40% for Nicholson. Um, and through these names, we can identify a network on Jamaica that connected Nicholson to these planters, uh, plantation owners, other traders, uh, traders from North America and traders from London that shows these connections across the Atlantic world that were necessary to stimulate British engagement in uh, the production of raw cotton and therefore the cotton industry. Which leads us back then to um, the development of the cotton trade and cottonopolis in Britain, which was carried on following the allure of cotton, the desire to um, first obtain and then replace these particular commodities from India, and then with the access to raw cotton provided through the Caribbean, we see a series of innovations in the development of a new industry that was intended to take advantage of these options. Initially, um, sorry, could you go back one? Yeah, um, thank you. Initially, what we see in the 18th century is efforts to imitate, efforts to replicate the designs that were coming out of India in particular in various different contexts. And on the left-hand side, we have a great example of why the woolen industry in Britain couldn't quite compete with these new opportunities. This was an effort by Jane Vigore to use similar designs um, to create something in wool that had the same color, the same majesty as some of these cotton cloths that were being imported. However, um, on wool like this, it was difficult to replicate the same level of quality. And therefore, what we see over this consequent century is the development of items like these, both from, uh, well, Lancashire uh, and Manchester specifically, whereby we can see, uh, if you compare this to the previous slide uh, and the wool, the development of images and designs that were very crisp, very specific, brightly colored, and both alluded to the designs that had become so popular through the Indian trade, but also altered these for the particular English context. This was at the highest end of the market though. And while there was a huge significant growth in very high quality cotton, uh, both as particular yarns of high quality yarn through to cloth, through to finished printed commodities, that wasn't the entirety of the industry. And as well as replicating and imitating designs like this, we also see the development of industrial cotton, the ability through the use of technology and innovation to produce cotton on a scale that in time would surpass that of anywhere else on the planet. 
And Lancashire with Manchester at its core was at the heart of this process. We see by the middle of the 19th century, Manchester having over hundred cotton mills producing uh, the most significant part of Britain's cotton manufacturer. And as you can see on the slide, from 1770 to 1831, the proportion of the British economy that depended on cotton increased from 2.6% to 22.4% and had become by that point the most uh, significant sector in the economy, as you might imagine, vastly larger than, uh, for example, the financial services industry was during the financial crisis in 2008, just to try and put this into perspective. Through these industrial developments, we had the creation of mills such as this one um, in Manchester that allowed new technologies uh, initially powered by water and then powered by steam um, to radically change the way in which individuals could produce and the sorts of individuals uh, increasingly using things like child labor could produce cotton cloth on a massive scale. In this item, which is a uh, drawing that was drawn up as a valuation of the Ancoats mill owned by McConnell and Kennedy, we can see the division of different parts of this uh, enterprise um, designed around different parts of the process. So what we have here, as you can see, this, is, this was a mill that was just off Union Street in Ancoats, uh, near what is now known as the Murray Mill area of the city. Um, and this drawing indicates the different ways in which uh, different parts of the process were all brought together within these complexes, employing in a very, very small space, hundreds of people laboring with machines to produce cotton. Although the key is a little bit unclear, the division of this building starts really on the bottom right-hand side where there's the D, which is the engine room. McConnell and Kennedy were effective as cotton owners because they had a background in machine making. And they realized uh, quite early on when somebody didn't turn up to buy one of their steam engines that they built, that they could use it for themselves. So they started building factories like this. And this machine, the steam engine in the bottom right hand corner was able to then fuel everything else that was going on in the building. In E, the room directly next to it is the old factory where there was the first part of the process and then goods would be carried over the road into G and H where they'd be finished as cloth. So he would take in raw cotton, turn this into yarn, and then produce finished cloths, all within the same factory complex. Now today, this probably doesn't sound that radical, but through images like this, through the McConnell and Kennedy collection, we can see over a 20 year period, the radical change in the way in which work was undertaken in Manchester, and the way in which these mills completely changed the shape of the city and the way it was understood both by people living there and visitors. It's during this period, uh, or slightly after this particular drawing was made, that visitors started to reflect on Manchester as being the city of a hundred chimneys. And it was described as being somewhere covered in smog where there was the constant clattering of looms and spindles and where 300,000 people labored to produce cotton for the world market. And this is really where we get to see the point of Cottonopolis not just taking the world into it and being shaped by its desire to, um, to replicate and replace uh, international products, but instead Manchester becomes the great exporter, producing cotton that was sold to markets across the world. We see by 1800 that British cotton could be produced at significantly lower costs to its Indian competitors. Manchester, um, produced cloth that served a domestic market. And this was especially the case with some of the, the fancier materials, the very elegant fabrics, the rich designs I showed you earlier, but also produced commodities that were sold to a global market, sometimes of a lower quality and often carrying designs that were particularly sought after in different parts of the world. So for example, the painting that we can see on screen here of a market in the Caribbean shows a variety of different textiles um, being worn and sold um, by individuals living in the Caribbean. Um, and the designs that we see are slightly different to those that we might expect um, from the calicos I presented earlier with the uh, classical sort of floral arrangements and the intricate designs. These were stripes, they were checks, and they were designed as much for comfort in these hot climates um, as they were to fit the specific uh, consumer demands of people in West Africa and the Caribbean. 
And Manchester's cotton production was tailored to suit these particular demands. And it did so very successfully. By 1853, around 94% of Britain's cotton was exported to Africa or America. And this is a huge turnaround when we think about where we were starting 100 years before. While raw cotton um, was obviously produced in the Americas using labor from Africa, enslaved labor, of course, from Africa, by the time we get to 1853, these markets are now also the places that are purchasing the vast majority of cotton that's exported from England, creating a cyclical system where these connections serve to sort of replicate themselves and further enrich the industries on which they depend. During the same period, by 1853, Britain had overtaken India uh, as the largest manufacturer of cotton in the world. And it was in 1829 that Bengal, for the first time in its history, started importing more cotton than it exported. This is a revolutionary train change in the way not just Britain was undertaking the manufacture of cotton, but also with repercussions across cotton markets around the world and societies on which they depended. Which leads us to the final item uh, of today, which is from John Rylands, the uh, person whose wealth founded the library, um, his personal connection of papers. And what we see here is part of a scrapbook, basically, of various different uh, items, including drawings of engines, um, pictures of different types of cloths and cloth, but also these samples that were produced in John Ryland's factories in Manchester. As was noted at the start by Jeanette, John Ryland's at this stage, when these were produced, was the largest manufacturer of cotton in Britain. And the way that he was able to produce various different designs using different colors, in this case, all stripes, but we can see elsewhere, um, plain cloth and also other patterned cloth as well. John Rylands is catering to this vast mass market. These are not, as you can see, the rich, glorious materials that were being produced in Gujarat 800 years ago, but they were serving a massive market around the world. And through these and through this wider scrapbook, uh, we can see how John Rylands was at the heart of this process. And Manchester, around 1860, when these were produced, was maintaining its position as Cottonopolis. It had brought together the world in terms of its inspirations, in terms of its commodities, and had reshaped these through Manchester to then be exported to a global audience. And with that, we see uh, what we could describe as the making of global Cottonopolis. So thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, oh, you've got your image credits there. <laughs> Are we ready for questions? Um, oh, I'll put my camera on, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you both for that fantastic presentation. It's so great to see kind of the, the archival documents, but then also this very you know, aesthetically pleasing object of the pattern book as well at the end. Um, we've got some questions coming in already, um, but I'd like to encourage the audience to put some more in because we've done really well keeping to time. So we should have about 15 or 20 minutes of questions. Um, I wonder if I could start with a question about the technologies. I had a question for you myself as a medievalist, and it ties in with another question that we've had. Um, I was really struck with the kind of very early fabrics that you showed, the ones from the 13th century, uh, the Indian fabrics. And I wanted to ask you, you know, how they were printed, um, you know, whether they were whether they were printed with blocks or whether it was rollers. And then David Huggill, I hope I've pronounced your name right, has also said, please, could you say if the lovely calico made in India was handmade or by machine? So do you know anything about the technologies pre- uh, the kind of mechanization of the processes in Manchester? Yeah, so the use of machines to produce cotton is an ancient one. Um, basic spindles, spinning wheels that could be used by hand were used to create cotton yarn um, in all of these different places really in the world that are producing raw cotton. Uh, to simply take the cotton plant, which uh, if you've never seen one, uh, basically just looks like a cotton ball, just a little bundle of white fibers you have to roll it to produce yarn. And this was something that quite quickly people realized you could do using a machine or a device uh, to create yarn. And then you could use that yarn um, in things like manual looms to produce cloth. So machines were involved, um, certainly in the production of cotton uh, elsewhere in the world. The, the difference with Manchester and what allowed it to suddenly start to demand and produce so much more cotton was the use of energy saving machines. So the shift from a single individual using a single loom or a single spindle to having steam power or water power 
powering an individual working with 128 spindles at the same time is obviously a game changer. So the actual cloth making technology, um, there were many efforts to sort of replicate and learn from uh, the way in which Indian weavers were using these sorts of machines, but then to mechanize them. Uh, and what we see in this period is a difference between what you might, uh, what some historians have called sort of macro um, technologies, like the invention of the steam engine, and then ongoing incremental changes. So every few years, a new invention comes in that improves these uh, machines slightly, allows them to do something slightly different, create a new design, um, go slightly bigger, slightly faster. Um, and it's through this process that we get industrialization in the classic sense in Manchester. Uh, the second part of the question about the printing, um, I think those images were all block printed. Um, so yeah, using an individual with a cut block, pressing it into the ink and then pressing it onto the cloth, which is still used um, in parts of India today to create incredibly vibrant fabrics of that sort. Um, there were other fabrics, of course, uh, that used other ways of making the designs, but printing uh, was the only way you really could produce cotton on such huge scales. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've got another question from Becky, which follows on a bit from what you were saying about the kind of industrialization process. Um, so how typical was McConnell, McConnell and Kennedy in terms of performing every process as opposed to just weaving or spinning, say, as in Lancashire towns? Um, and then I, um, she adds, I know this is not the main topic of import replacement and the destruction of local industries in India. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Can you, can you see the question up on your, it was quite a long question. Have you got it up on your screen? So the one about um, how typical was the factory yeah, in terms of performing sorry. every process? Um, so McConnell and Kennedy were innovators in the sense of bringing this together, but they weren't the only innovators. The process of industrialization around Lancashire started with a system uh, called putting out where local um, people like Arkwright or Old No, who is somebody else whose business collection is at the John Rylands, um, started to sort of have new structures of business that allowed them to work with lots of different weavers independently and then sort of bring that material together under the same roof at particular starts, sorry, at particular stages of the process of manufacture. Over time, you see more and more of this being brought together under the same roof. Although there is specialization, um, McConnell and Kennedy specialized in producing yarn. That was their main uh, product that they sold um, both to other weavers and other companies in Manchester, but also through Glasgow to a wide Atlantic economy. So the, the process of the, the factory process was much about bringing together lots of laborers to work on these machines together and increase efficiency and allow these huge machines to be employed um, as much as it was necessarily uh, bringing these together all under the same roof in terms of the stage of the process, if that answers the question. I hope so. The questions are coming in thick and fast now. So I'm <laughs> going to take the one from uh, Alka Rahman next, uh, who thanks you for a great presentation. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the connection between the cotton staples and mechanization. So as we know, the long staple was used on the spinning machines. Was the discovery of this critical for mechanization? A very particular technical question. It's, it's a very particular question and one that I know Alka would probably be better at answering than me. Um, uh, I think the, as you've argued yourself in, in relation to other parts of this process, I think the, the development of machine, of the spinning machines, as I said a second ago, went through various stages of incremental improvement. Um, I don't know whether any of the individual parts of this mechanization process could have been taken out and allowed the same level of growth in other areas. Um, but I would be delighted to talk more about whether that's the case in this specific case of the long stable. Okay, thank you. Um, we have some questions which seem to be about the kind of beginnings of the cotton industry and then the sort of endings of it. So um, David asked, are you able to say anything about the role of the ship canal transporting cotton from Liverpool? And I presume this is one of the, um, you know, the kind of key factors, the location for why this sprang up so much in, in Manchester. And Gigi asks, what caused the demise of the cotton industry in Manchester? So can you give us a, a, a logistical overview? Yeah. So the ship canal is hugely important. Um, uh, as you suggest, um, and the growth, the first mills are less likely to be in Manchester specifically and are built more 
in locations around Lancashire, generally with access to water that could power the water mill element of the earlier mills before they were replaced with steam. What you see in Manchester, and the reason in part for Manchester's extraordinary growth, is a collection of factors that include the ability to transport raw cotton to Manchester effectively via the canals and the river system from Liverpool and other places, but also through the same system to connect Manchester to all these different locations. And we see the explosion in uh, the development both of cotton mills specifically, but also other industries around this part of Northern England. Uh, we know around Bradford, there's an early iron industry in uh, the Calder Canal connects to Leeds and of course then across to uh, Yorkshire as well. And these improvements in transportation were absolutely vital for these commodities to both be uh, produced on this scale, but also then to be sold effectively. Um, similarly, if we look into the later 19th century, we of course know that industrialization in places like Birmingham was heavily dependent on the growth of the canal system there. And this was boosted further from 1830 onwards, I think in Manchester's case, with the development of uh, the railways to, um, to Liverpool as well. The actual placement of different mills across Manchester maps quite neatly onto the development of these canals. And I think in the case of the McKellen and Connody drawing that we saw, it was only a couple of streets away from the canal that was being opened at the same time. So there's a clear connection there that people at the time, contemporaries were well aware of that the canal system was absolutely vital. And that's why it received so much investment often from people involved in the cotton industry itself. Okay, and the end, can you- Oh, the demise, sorry. I don't, I don't, know, nothing, I don't um, know nothing about the kind of present yeah. day, so I would also be- so, the, the cotton industry in Manchester starts to decline in the second half of the 19th century to a degree, as various satellite towns uh, become more well-suited, more connected, um, and places like Oldham, Rochdale, Todmorden, and others uh, start to generate uh, with new factories built to the newest requirements, um, start to supplant Manchester as sort of cottonopolis and it becomes a little bit more distributed in ways that are maintained through into the uh, early 20th century, albeit with hugely more competition in terms of uh, American made cotton and European made cotton that start to, the, in countries that start to go through a similar industrializing process related to the industry. Um, and of course, this is then in the 20th century, uh, continues and the decline of these textile towns um, is pretty well known. Um, and I think, you know, obviously still has huge repercussions for the area. Um, I think an interesting point with the, the demise of the cotton industry in Manchester as well is that by the time we get to around 1850, an awful lot of the early cotton magnets, their families have moved into other types of industry and other types of activity. So we see the rise of Manchester as a banking center, um, as a cultural center, a political center in ways that it just wasn't a hundred years before. And that sort of changes the dynamic of the city and creates um, something that we'd more see perhaps as sort of modern metropolis than simply a cotton producing town. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question here, which may be more for Jeanette. Um, mm -hmm. It's a Steve question, if you can see it. He says, my father, a chemist in a dye factory in East Manchester in the 50s, talked about the Africans, which were brightly coloured prints for cotton produced for sale in Africa. Um, and are there examples of these in the collections? So could you tell us a bit more about your wider textile collections? Yeah, um, the only two fabric sample books we're able to find uh, was the one we showed you from the John Rylands and the other one, which collection was that? Old oh, No, oh, no yeah. which was in a really poor condition. So I don't think we do have any of the African fabrics, which is a real shame because you were talking about them earlier, wasn't you? Yeah, and I think yeah. as well as colours, African fabrics in the 18th and 19th century at least were also very distinctive with checked patterns and that mm. sort of thing that were very popular. Um, and matched on to consumer styles and demands in West Africa that had been uh, catered to by European traders from about the 16th century onwards with the first Portuguese um, trade in West Africa. Yeah, so we did look for checked African prints, but we didn't manage to find any. But I see that um, Julianne's put in the uh, chat that the Whitworth might be able to help with that. Yeah, in fact, I was just going to mention, I mean, in fact, the Whitworth is the place that has the kind of the samples and the pattern books, really. Um, mm. Thank you. Um, so have we got any more questions coming through? Um, David again asked if the manufacturing of cotton, did it, did it lead to unemployment of people who were weaving individually? 
uh, I, I would presume, presume so, but perhaps kind of all the yeah. producers would keep going um, for longer. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of research going on about quite how far this impact was and whether it reshaped working patterns and saw people who were um, traditional weavers sort of changing the way that they worked and moving into other industries. Yeah. Um, over time, of course, it completely changed the way in which labour functioned in Britain. If we look at the environment of cotton workers um, in 1850 and try and compare that to weavers of wool in 1700, they're very, very different, completely um, different ways in which people engage with employers uh, rather than working on their own and that sort of thing. Um, but it's also quite an incremental process, I suppose. So there are bursts of activity of people threatened um, by the idea of losing their jobs to machines. And of course, we, we know that the Luddites and the swing revolts and lots of examples of, uh, of radical activity sort of spurred on by these fears. Mm -hmm. um, but the change, the shift over time is I think uh, slightly more incremental than there being, uh, it took, you know, the, the growth of steam powered uh, mills was fairly slow initially. I think there were about 2,000 steam engines in 1800 and then 20,000 by about 1830. Mm -hmm. So it's growing all the time and it's pushing people into different types of work. Um, but I think that's the story is, it's the different types of work and the way in which that has an impact on local communities and changes the way people are able to relate to their own work. It changes the training, changes the wages and creates completely new and weird and horrible uh, conditions. Factory and, time. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think that's the relationship. It's not a simple um, people lost their jobs and were sort of made destitute as much as there's a the longer term impact that, that radically uh, altered English society. Could I just add to that? So um, two years ago, we did lots of work around the Peterloo Bicentenary. Now the people that came to Peterloo had walked from the outlying villages and they were not factory employers. They were the handloom weavers. So they were this, this sort of older trade. So the connection between political radicalism and changing as, as you touched upon with Luddites and things, I think is really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I've, there are lots more questions which um, in the chat and I won't have time to take them all, but I can see that quite a few of them have been answered by audience members and, and colleagues from the university who are kind of feeding in. So I'd encourage everybody to look at those and perhaps we can preserve the chat at the end and we can follow up with some of those. Um, I think we have time for one more question and it kind of opens up some of those bigger um bigger kind of issues which are in the background um maya wolf robinson has said was the demise of the importance of the cotton industry connected to the abolition of slavery in the us and then later brazil so i wonder if you could make some kind of closing remarks on that if there's anything to add just you know just briefly. Um, <laughs> we can take up we can have five minutes if you've got an extensive answer yeah i i don't know i think the demise of the cotton industry, as I say, it's, it's quite a slow process and the expansion of towns like Rochdale, Todmorden um, and Oldham is all after 1660, I think. Um, and, you know, the real growth of these towns, I think Oldham is the largest manufacturer of cotton in the world in 70, sorry, in 1870. Um, and these are sustained past the abolition of slavery um, in the US and Brazil. Um, I think the difficulty is that the the abolition of slavery in either case doesn't immediately change the conditions of laborers on cotton plantations in either case and cotton remains a hugely important commodity produced in both regions for sale on international markets that allow people in Britain to continue producing cotton using um, American cotton produced on plantations in the south. So I think the decline is, is slow and is more related to the rise of other forms of competition in the cotton industry. Um, perhaps with better access to cotton from America or Brazil um, than the English case, but I don't think there's direct causality between the two to a significant degree. Thank you. Um, and I think um, I'm, I'm sort of trying to synthesize many questions into something to ask you. Something which is coming up, a few people have said things like, you know, why Manchester? Why did this happen in Manchester? There seems to be a strong argument on the part of Liverpool in the chat as well. So, you know, is Liverpool being overlooked? Um, somebody suggested it's the weather. So, you know, yeah. to conclude, could you, um, you know, tell us why Manchester and, you yeah. know, and why we're here today? <laughs> so I think Manchester had 
a lot going for it in terms of location. Um, it was a significant market town. Um, its population was around 19,000 in 1700, and this skyrocketed to about 400,000 by the middle of the 19th century. Um, and in doing so, it drew on the wider Lancashire area, smaller villages, people moving into the city. Um, and part of that was, it was able to link to Liverpool, but it wasn't dominated by Liverpool's port, which remained quite distinct in terms of the way in which individuals invest their capital. Liverpool was much more connected to the Atlantic economy, while Manchester was able to look inward. And the connections that we have within England, there are very strong links between Manchester through Halifax, Leeds, and into Yorkshire that are important. The competition in the 18th century between woolen manufacture and cotton manufacture takes place across this broader scope of Northern England. And people, uh, investors in some of these early mills are drawing on networks that come from across this. The capital to invest in cotton comes from across a wider area and the expertise to do so. As I mentioned, McConnell and Kennedy, as you might have guessed, uh, are both Scottish. They trained in Glasgow as machinists and then moved to Manchester because it sat at this meeting point um, within the country and was becoming, through its connection with Liverpool, a place where you could access raw cotton, but also because of its links inland, especially to the various different valleys and riverine regions um, towards Yorkshire. These were the places where the earliest mills that were obviously powered by water were able to be built. You have to have that particular environmental condition to allow for those sorts of mills. And then when you transport this into a steam powered mill, obviously having quite close geography and expertise is helpful. Um, other facts would be Manchester is uh, not a traditional corporate town in the way that others in England are. So there are slightly less rules and regulations potentially getting in the way of doing um, innovative things. Um, and that contributes uh, to, to people being able to do strange new things on the edge of the city. But also things like Ancoats was built very specifically as sort of a factory area, which needed the space. In other places like Liverpool, the port had expanded and lots of the area around Liverpool had already been developed for other things, I suppose. And Manchester had this space close to the canal, close to the rivers um, that made it possible. So it's environmental, it's... Um, a consequence of geography, it's institutional. Um, and I think these are all overlapping causes that allow uh, Manchester to obtain these, this unique position. So Thank what you. about the climate? There's a question in there that I'd love you to answer about whether having a sort of damp climate is good for cotton production, or is that a myth? I think that's a myth. Oh, that's a um, shame. Or at least I, I, I think, uh, yeah, there's there's cotton produced in enough places to suggest it's, it's not It doesn't need damp. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I you know, I, I just direct everybody back to the chat. There is this kind of, kind of, very kind of erudite discussion happening around this as well. Alison Brown has also pointed out that you know the, the institutions of Manchester. She's asked about the scientific trade and industry institutions and how they fed into this. I don't think we have time necessarily to go into that, but I think it, it's almost all part of that kind of you know that kind of we could make a kind of tony wilson hyperbolic statement about the kind of you know, <laughs> fundamental psychogeographical essence of manchester as well as the kind of very practical ones do you want to say anything about the institutions before i wrap up oh, yeah. i think i touched i think yeah the, the networks and the institutions they generated across the country are really important um you, we'd see similar uh, i think if we looked at industrialization in birmingham as well where there's the well-known sort of scientific institutions around the Lunar, the Lunar Club that are very well known. And you see similar in Manchester, of course. Um, and the connection to the Atlantic world, I think is important. There's, there's lots of exchanges going on between Manchester and North America, um, discussing things about business and cotton and the way it can be produced in the markets that desire it. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much. This has been such a fantastic seminar to, to end this year's seminar series with, you know, it kind of brings us right back to to the city and to the library, you know, which is the, the reason why we're all here having this, this seminar. Um, I also wanted to thank all of the library teams who've been who've made this possible. Um, you know, not just the curators, you know, so many curators have spoken and have worked with the academics to do the presentations, but also the events team and the IT team. So I would like you to put your cameras on so we can see you and thank you. If you want to come out of the shadows so we can give you a wave at the end. Come on, Jeanette, drag them over. Um, <laughs> So our, our, you know, they've worked absolutely tirelessly. It's been, it's been a real, you know, we, we really wanted to do something. Hello, thank you. We wanted to do something really 
spectacularly <laughs> and we couldn't do it without the work of people who are making it all work in the background so so thank you all so much for that i think it's been i think it's been a triumph and it's all thanks to you so, um <laughs> this is the last one of the series but we will be coming back uh next year in the next academic year so please look out for notices in the autumn um, about our next talks and um thank you all for joining us and we hope we'll see you all again